Thank you all so very much. I, I really love performing that piece. It's by Canadian composer James Wright, and it's based on the letters Beethoven wrote to the person he called his immortal beloved. So think for a moment about how the music made you feel. Sad, happy, melancholy, joyous. Robert Zatori is going to talk now about how music brings about these emotions. Robert is a senior fellow in the Azrieli program in Brain, Mind, and Consciousness at CIFAR, a cognitive neuroscientist at McGill University, and founding co-director of the International Laboratory for Brain, Music, and Sound Research. His research focuses on brain function and structure with a special interest in music and speech. Today, he will talk to you about the complex neurology behind our experience of music and how it gives rise to pleasure and emotion. Interestingly enough, he too is a trained musician who studied as an organist. So please join me in warmly welcoming Professor Zatori. Thank you very much, uh, Julie. Thank you uh, all for being here this wonderful evening and uh, with this wonderful trio before us. And um, I want to be sure to uh, acknowledge the fact that this whole uh, show was set up by the uh, Canadian Institute for Advanced Research um, with the support of the Israeli Foundation. And the, the program, in fact, is um, focused on the brain and consciousness. And um, it's a little broader than that as well. It really focuses on some very complex and uh, poorly understood functions, the, most, the highest um, sort of cognitive functions that we humans are capable of. And sometimes people ask me, well, why do you study something like music? Um, what, what's the point of that? There are many answers to that, but I sometimes point them to this statement, which is literally carved in stone on the front of our institute <laughs> on University Street in Montreal, or it's actually uh, coulé en beton because it's, it's actually um, concrete, I think, not stone. And uh, Wilder Penfield, who was the founder of our institute, um, basically said that what neuroscience is all about is trying to understand what it is to be human. How is it that the brain allows all of the functions that we have that make us human? And I think in that context, understanding complex phenomena like consciousness, like music, like aesthetics, um, I think is essential because I would argue that um, without those things, we wouldn't be human. So Julia earlier alluded to the origin of music and she mentioned that it was sort of a puzzle for uh, Darwin as to why we even have it. And indeed, he at some point sort of threw up his hands and said, well, it's one of the most mysterious faculties with which we are endowed. And he, he didn't really have a very good um, idea of what it was all about. But um, in uh, the latter part of his life, he reflected on various aspects of his life. And he had this to say in his autobiography. He said, if I had to live my life again, I would have made a rule to listen to some music at least once every week for perhaps the parts of my brain now atrophied would have kept, been kept active through use. So this is sage advice from a sage man. Um, and then he went on to point out that without music, um, there is a, a loss of the moral character and there is um, uh, a weakness of emotions. And so indeed, even though in his sort of theoretical uh, understanding he didn't have a good response about music, in his own sort of personal understanding he did. He had a very profound understanding that music is really about um, communicating, expressing emotion um, and feeling, and that it also keeps our brains healthy. So we're going to try to probe into this brain that allows us to produce and uh, understand and uh, perceive music. Um, and this diagram is from a, a paper, actually, we wrote with one of my former students, Joyce Chen, who's now a scientist here at Sunnybrook, uh, and Virginia Penhune. And uh, what we were trying to do is point out that the brain not only has to perceive music, it also has to produce music, because 
if no one produces music, you can't perceive it, right? So it's kind of a loop because the brain controls the motor actions of the muscles that allow you to produce music, but at the same time, those motor actions produce sounds which influence subsequent motor actions. So it's very much a loop in that respect. And it's a very complex system, of course. Uh, I'm only giving you kind of a caricature of it this evening. But here's a sort of a close-up. And don't worry, there won't be an exam at the end where you have to remember the, the nomenclature. But I do want to call your attention to um, this area in the temporal lobe here, the auditory cortex, because that's where impulses come in through the ear and then go through the brainstem and end up in the cortex there. And then there are a series of cortical circuits, which are quite complex, that interconnect the auditory areas with regions that have to do with motor control, in particular the premotor regions, and areas of the prefrontal cortex. And I'll come back to this idea that these circuits are essential in enabling many of the functions that um, are the reason why we're able to both produce and perceive music. Now, we want to probe inside the brains of musicians. How do we do that? There are various ways. Laurel il illustrated some very elegant studies using EEG, which allows you to look at temporally uh, unfolding events with great precision. We, um, in our lab at the Montreal Neurological Institute, have used various techniques, uh, but in particular um, magnetic resonance imaging, because that allows us to pinpoint uh, the location of brain um, areas that are active during particular tasks that are of interest. And one such uh, function of interest is the performance of music. And so in order to understand the performance of music, you actually have to get people to play music inside an MRI scanner. And I don't know how many of you have been inside an MRI scanner, but it's, <laughs> it's rather confined. <laughs> However, um, we have uh, been able to work with some um, music technology uh, engineers to build us some instruments. And if we can go to the video, this will illustrate. The basic idea behind what we're trying to do is to use music in a global way to understand brain function. I look at what happens in the brain when cello players are playing the cello, which is exciting to me because I am a cello player and a neuroscientist. Playing the cello inside of the MRI is definitely very different than playing the cello outside of the MRI. For starters, um, you have to be lying down, which is a non-standard position for a cellist to be in. Um, there are also the constraints inherent in the instrument itself, uh, being that it doesn't actually have a resonant body, so you don't get the vibration feedback that you're used to getting from your instrument. It's also uh, equipped with gut strings, which are a very different feeling than the metal strings. They're much harder to get sound out of. So in this experiment, for the first time, we're looking at how the brain of a highly trained um, musician, specifically a cellist, is working when they're playing their instrument. So this is a, a very cool device that was actually built for us by Avram Hollinger, who is another um, person who's somehow ended up in Toronto. I don't know why they all come here. <laughs> So Avram uh, built this device which allows us to actually look at brain activity of a professional cellist when they're doing their thing. And what we see when we look at this uh, pattern here, so this is showing you the green areas are areas that are more active during the performance of uh, the instrument than uh, during other conditions. And we see indeed some of the same circuitry that was shown here. And I hasten to add that this paper was published in 2007 and this result was obtained only a couple of months ago, so, I, you know, we weren't sort of faking it. <laughs> and the areas involved are, of course, the auditory cortex, and over here in the parietal lobe, and this uh, frontal cortical area. And part of what this uh, shows us, with some analyses of the interrelationship between those regions, is that these regions are working together as a sort of a unit, because when you're playing the instrument, you um, not only have to produce the sound, but you have to adjust the position and the pressure of your uh, motor action in order to get just the right pitch. So the auditory and motor systems are in, in constant interaction under uh, those kinds of conditions. Now, in order to be able to play an instrument, 
um, if you take uh, highly trained musicians like we have on stage here, you have to undergo many, many years of practice and training. And another um, feature that we've been uh, trying to um, understand is how the brain changes as a consequence of all that training. So one nice thing about MRI is that we can not only look at brain activity, so as we're looking at there with functional magnetic resonance image, but we can also look at brain anatomy. So here are some uh, images of the amount of cortical thickness that is different between people with musical training and people without. This is some, some work done by Patrick Bermudez, who actually was in Toronto but came back to Montreal, so <laughs> he's in our good books. And what Patrick uh, discovered is that there are areas of uh, greater cortical thickness, so the actual uh, amount of gray matter in the brain is greater um, in the auditory areas, here in the right and in the left hemisphere, as well as in the motor cortex, uh, and also in the frontal cortex. So we interpret this as evidence that there's a certain degree of plasticity, meaning that the brain of a musician has adapted to be able to do what they do so well, and indeed the regions that are involved are uh, many of the same ones that uh, I've just shown you are um, involved in the playing of the instrument. Now, another very important feature is um, not only the uh, amount of practice that you have, but also the age at which you begin uh, to train. And not only in the case of music, but in many other domains as well, sports and vision and so forth, it is shown that the early training is more important because the uh, development of the brain has more plasticity than later on in life. And actually, I'm just wondering uh, for our musicians, I'd like to know what ages they started their, their musical training. So how old were you when you first started taking lessons? Three. Three. <laughs> and Jamie? I was five. Five. And Ronan? Six. Six. So you were, you were, just, you were just on the edge there. Um, <laughs> now, I started training as an organist when I was 13. And this is why these guys were on stage playing. <laughs> and I'm giving a lecture. And we know that these uh, factors play an important role because if we look at, the, um, again, the anatomy of the brain as a function of the age at which training began, and this is controlling for the total number of years of training, so it's just about the age at which training began, we see that there are changes in some of those frontal areas that I showed you in the previous slide. This is work done by Ann Bailey, who is another, another one who moved to Toronto. Um, <laughs> working in uh, Virginia Penhune's lab. And not only is there uh, a change in the uh, cortical structure, but also that cortical structure allows you to um, perform more synchronously. So when the musicians are playing together, um, they're better able to tap in synchrony or move in synchrony if they had that earlier training. So some of those phenomena that uh, Laurel was talking about, the degree of extreme precision that's necessary when they play, which you can hear, um, is really uh, much easier to achieve if you begin training early. It's not impossible to achieve if you begin later, but it is more difficult. Okay, um, so that is um, a lot about the performance aspect, and uh, I want to move to a different feature that involves some of the same um, brain systems, and that is the ability to imagine music musical imagery, it's the ability that we have to um, imagine the sounds of music. And I've put uh, Beethoven here because in uh, a little while at the end of the evening, we're going to hear the trio perform the, um, the Archduke trio. And this is actually some of uh, Beethoven's sketches for that piece. And that piece was composed uh, around 1811, and we know that uh, Beethoven was already quite deaf by then, because in 1802, he wrote his famous Heilungstadt Testament, basically a long letter where he pours out his heart about the fact that he's going deaf, and he is even considering suicide because it's so difficult for him um, to consider this. And yet he persevered, and what's remarkable, of course, is that even at a point in his life when he was really quite completely deaf, and there's very good documentation of this, he was able to compose 
magnificent music, which means that he must have been able to imagine it extremely clearly and well to be able to write it down. So that's um, really quite remarkable. Now, how do we study that in the lab? Well, we have different uh, sorts of approaches, but um, one, of the, one of the approaches that we've used, we're going to try to simulate here um, in, the, uh, in the concert hall. So what's going to happen now is the following. The musicians are going to play an extremely well-known tune that you will recognize instantly, but they won't play the whole thing. They'll play about the first half or so, and then they'll stop. Your job is, as soon as they stop, you have to imagine the rest of the tune as it would normally play out in the appropriate rhythm and so forth. You really need to just imagine that sound in your mind's ear. And when you get to the end of the song, okay, at the very end when, the, when your, imagine, your imagination has stopped, then you press your clicker. Got that? Okay. So the musicians will play, they'll stop halfway through, and then you continue in your mind, and then you click when you get to the very end, and then we're going to see when the uh, clicking is happening. Please. <laughs> Okay, some of you were, <laughs> were asleep. <laughs> Maybe that's it. There's, you were supposed to actually stop. You weren't meant to keep singing because it, it is kind of, you can, if there's anyone that can't get out of it, you know. So. The idea here is that um, hopefully most of you experience the ability to imagine the continuation of that song. And what happens in our experiments is that we actually scan the brain during that silent period when people are imagining something like that, when there's no actual sound, but they, uh, they're trying to recreate the sound in their mind. And when we look at um, the brain activity associated with that, we see the following. So, in the, um, here's the lateral view of the brain again. In the orange is the auditory cortex, which is active when people are listening to real sound. That's the control condition when they hear the actual music. And then during the silent period, some of those same regions are active. So in the green regions, we see parts of the brain that are active both for the real music and in silence when you're imagining the music. So portions of the auditory cortex, which respond to real sound, also respond to internal sound which is really pretty amazing because there's no actual sound there and yet those neurons are active. In addition, some of the same regions we saw before, in particular here, the dorsal premotor cortex, that's typically very much uh, recruited during these kinds of tasks because imagination is an active task. It actually requires, we think, a motoric component as well as a perceptual component. And so this circuitry that we're talking about is um, really interesting because it is able to be uh, put to work, not only for decoding external stimuli, but also for internal recreation of previously experienced information. There's another feature that I want to um, point out um, of this uh, auditory frontal network, and this relates to some of the things that uh, Laurel mentioned, which is the ability to uh, anticipate events. So Laurel mentioned that primarily in the context of rhythmic events, anticipating when something will happen, but it's also possible to anticipate um, the nature of the event. So for example, in this study carried out by Mark Schoenwiesner, what we see is that both auditory and frontal cortex respond to a deviation from what's expected. In this sort of experiment, you hear a sequence of tones, and then at some point, um, a tone is presented that was not one of the one of the ones in the sequence previously presented, and so therefore it's a deviation from the regular expected pattern. And the nervous system in general is very sensitive to deviations from um, regularity. The important point here is that you can't respond to a deviation if you don't have um, 
a model of what it is that's going to come. In other words, you have an expectation, you have a prediction of what's going to come, and then what, that, what does come differs from what was expected, and that's the deviation. If you have no capacity to generate that prediction, you won't notice anything that's deviant, right? So we're going to come back to that uh, topic in the context of emotion uh, in uh, a couple of minutes. So I've been uh, telling you about the circuits which start in the auditory cortex, and of course the auditory cortex is responsible for our ability to perceive sound and our ability to perceive relationships uh, of sound, rhythms and harmonies and uh, tonal patterns and musical intervals and, and so on and so forth. Um, and I've also talked to you about these pathways that go from the auditory cortex into other parts of the brain and actually feed back eventually back to the auditory cortex. And these loops, so-called, um, are important not only for sound, um, but also are enhanced by training and are necessary for um, the production of music. So there's a very nice parallel between production and perception. As well, I've uh, illustrated evidence that some of these same circuits are important to enable our ability to imagine sounds, and that these um, systems are highly sensitive to regularities and therefore are able to generate expectancies. But what does all that have to do with pleasure? Because I promised you in the title, at least, that I was going to tell you something about pleasure. Um, and uh, we've already heard about emotion in music. Uh, and pleasure, I would argue, is um, a very significant aspect of the emotional impact that one gets uh, from music. In fact, um, one of the ways that we look at this is by um, measuring when people experience a strong, pleasurable response to music so that they get chills or sort of shivers down the spine. How many of you have experienced that this evening? There's quite a few of you. I'm sure maybe when uh, Julie hit that high note, that was, that was uh, one, mo one moment. For me, I think it was during uh, Otonio Porteño, and that's possibly because I'm from Argentina, so I have a strong uh, connection to that music. So um, when we talk about pleasure, we're actually talking about a very different system than this cortical system. We're actually talking about a system deep in the brain. So in this illustration here, there's a, a cutout, and you're seeing some of these deep structures, basal ganglia. Um, and it's actually a very complex system. Again, I emphasize these are highly oversimplified sort of diagrams. There's a lot of other structures in the medial frontal lobe and also in brainstem nuclei. But, um, one of the most important comp components of this system is the so-called striatum, which actually consists of two subparts, which I'll get back to in a moment. And uh, these structures are interesting because, first of all, they're phylogenetically very ancient in the sense that um, if you look in the brain of a salamander, you will see that they also have a striatum similar in, in, uh, in structure to ours. Um, and furthermore, these systems tend to be important for what biologists have called stimuli or events that are essential for survival of some sort. So for example, they would respond to a food reward. So if you take uh, a lab rat and you feed it a certain amount of food, um, areas in the striatum will respond uh, because it's a pleasurable sensation. Similarly, these uh, regions have been shown to respond to sexual stimulation. And both food and sex are obviously essential for survival, food for the survival of the individual. Sex is obviously necessary for the survival of the species, because without reproduction, you wouldn't have the species. And um, it's also been shown that this same system responds to certain kinds of drugs, like um, amphetamines, uh, cocaine, alcohol. Part of the reason they're so uh, powerful and dangerous is because they have a direct chemical action on this uh, system. So. A few years ago, we were wondering about uh, music and why it gives pleasure, and we know from a vast amount of literature that this is a system that is associated with strong pleasure. And so we wondered, could it be that music would engage the same system? Because after all, music is nothing like uh, any of these other stimuli. It's not a substance, it doesn't have a direct chemical uh, effect. And um, strictly speaking, it's not even really necessary for survival. You might be miserable without it, but you wouldn't be dead with, without it, right? <laughs> so we've done a series of experiments that show that indeed uh, it is the case that 
this uh, area of the striatum is active, um, is responding to very strong musical pleasure. And we've done it in a number of ways using a number of different techniques. These are all um, sort of vertical cuts through the brain like this. And you see the activity in these deep structures, ventral striatum here, also here, and also here with different measures. Uh, in the older studies, we did it with uh, just looking at cerebral blood flow. In more recent studies, we were able to look at dopamine, which is important because dopamine is a neurotransmitter, and um, it is the neurotransmitter that is most important in signaling reward. In many of those animal studies that I mentioned, um, that's the um, sort of molecular signal that there is a, a strong salient and uh, pleasurable stimulus there. Um, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll come back to this uh, third study in, in just a second. But in this one, which was carried out by Valerie Salampour, one of my former uh, PhD students, we noticed uh, something, which is that uh, there were actually sort of two blobs. You can probably see there's one more uh, in the upper part of the brain, the dorsal striatum, and one in the more ventral region. And we wondered um, why there were those two responses. And so with a little bit of uh, careful analysis, Valerie was able to um, demonstrate that there's two separate phases of the response. So one of them is in the dorsal stratum, and one of them is in the ventral stratum, and they're divided according to the moment of the peak pleasure. So in these experiments, we have people listen to music that they themselves have selected as chill-inducing. So this is not hard to do. People have lots of recordings that they say, every time I hear this passage, it's a particular spot, and oh my god, it's just wonderful. And when that happens, they indicate to us that it's happened by pressing a button. We can also measure physiological responses like heart rate and so on. Um, and what happens in the brain is really quite interesting because in the moments prior to that peak pleasure, there is a response here in the light blue line in the dorsal striatum, which is this area. And then at the moment of peak pleasure, it goes down, whereas the ventral striatum, which is down here, is slightly active during that time, but then Immediately when the peak pleasure moment arises, that's when it really strongly shoots up. And so this means that there are actually two different things going on. One is the actual experience of that pleasure, when you really feel that chill. But another, and I think extremely important one, is this anticipatory phase. And this is, I think, again related to some of the ideas that uh, Laurel told us about. Now, we're going to try to do a little uh, experiment here. and. Probably, if there's an ethicist in the audience, I'll be in trouble because I haven't gotten informed consent from you. <laughs> However, we're going to try it anyway. Um, and the idea here is that um, I'm, I'm trying to have you understand this idea of anticipating and then receiving the element or the um, stimulus that you expect based on what came before it. So our trio has kindly agreed to play the same uh, segment of music uh, with three different endings, okay? And what I want you to do is very simple. You're going to hear each of these three, and I want you to, at the end, after you've heard all of them, so just hold off until you've heard everything, at the end I want you to uh, vote for the one that you found most pleasurable. So it'll be the same piece of music, three different endings, and at the end I want you to use your clicker and decide if it's uh, number one, number two, or number three. Now, number two. This is an experiment. <laughs> now, number three, please. Okay, now you get to vote. Which of those three did you find most pleasurable? Okay, so that's very interesting. 
The experiments don't always work. This is... I think I just lost a beer over this. So the first, um, the first one was actually the conventional ending, which is to say it's the most uh, predictable and standard one. The second one was slightly uh, non-conventional, but actually still within kind of a tonal structure. Uh, and the third one was a completely unpredictable, uh, essentially random set of notes that had no relationship to what came before. <laughs> so at the very least, most of you, except for a few recalcitrant <laughs> people, and, and maybe you need to come to the lab later to... <laughs> we'll, we'll check out your, your auditory cortex. Um, <laughs> So what's interesting here is I think that um, this whole idea of uh, predictability is obviously playing an extremely important role because you obviously preferred the one that had the highest predictability, which means that you were able, based on the first set of notes, to anticipate that that ending should have a certain sound, right? So if you hadn't been able to do that, you wouldn't have shown any particular preference. And I think uh, in the context of music, both uh, the performance of it and the composition of it, musicians know this. Musicians understand the idea of um, playing around with the tension and the resolution that's afforded by our ability to um, have these expectancies that are either met, that are fulfilled, or that are not fulfilled. And there's some famous uh, music theorists, in fact, who've developed um, models about this. So, uh, if we come back to the brain for a moment, um, there's another aspect of um, musical pleasure that we haven't uh, entirely uh, talked about. So, up until now, we've talked about um, this uh, sort of strong experience of, of chills and, and pleasure, but most of our experience when listening to music doesn't necessarily involve such strong pleasure. Sometimes it does, and then it's, it's particularly... Uh, wonderful, but uh, oftentimes we listen to music and we just value it, we enjoy it, we like it, um, but it doesn't necessarily produce such a strong response. And we wondered whether uh, the same neural system is involved in um, that sort of experience as opposed to the very strong sort of physiological alteration that you get with chills. And so in this experiment, again, uh, Valerie Salampour was the student who did the project, and um, she came up with the idea that we could essentially use iTunes as our model. So what do we mean? Well, in iTunes, you get to listen to an excerpt of music, and then you decide whether you want to download it or not, and you have to spend a certain amount of money to download it, right? So what we did is we put people in the scanner, and we had them listen to pieces of music. In fact, these are new pieces of music they had never heard before. Um, but they were in a genre that we th were pretty confident that they would uh, probably like, at least some of them. And then they had to give a, a dollar rating as to how much money they'd be willing to spend for that piece of music. And then what we did is we looked in the whole brain and we used the dollar amount to investigate which regions are changing their activity depending on how much value is assigned, the value being the monetary amount. And what we see is that that same region that I had shown you before, that we saw in, uh, in the other experiments. So it's the ventral striatum, similarly to here, similarly to there. So in that case, we see that uh, this system is not only responsible for pleasure itself, but also is respons responsible for the value that we assign to music. And then we took one additional step, and for this, uh, aspect of the project, we got help from Randy McIntosh uh, here from the Rotman, uh, who has some very interesting uh, ways of analyzing the um, relationship between activity in one part of the brain and in another part of the brain by looking at the coupling between them. So sort of similar to what um, Laurel was talking about, we're looking at how the fluctuations in brain activity, are they synchronized or are they not synchronized? And if they're synchronized, it must be because those parts of the brain are uh, somehow interacting. And so when we looked to see what other parts of the brain were active uh, with the striatum, 
we saw the auditory cortex, which is shown here in a coronal section. So what this is telling us is that the auditory parts of the brain are interacting with the reward parts of the brain more and more as the value increases. So when you really like something and you're enjoying it and you want to buy it in this particular experiment, then it's, there's a lot of communication between those two systems compared to when you are not um, so enthralled by it and therefore aren't uh, willing to spend money on it. And I think this finding is really quite important and kind of ties together a lot of the themes that uh, I've talked about tonight because I've shown you earlier um, evidence that this cortical circuit that's on the surface of the brain, um, that's the most highly evolved part of the human brain. And that's the area, those are the, the systems that are important for perceiving music, performing music, and also for making these predictions, right? For the anticipation that allows us to decide whether the end or um, the continuation of something is what we expected or not. And that system is coupled with the most phylogenetically ancient system, which is the reward system, which is key to our emotions. And it, the, the idea that, that we're uh, sort of working on at the moment is that this interaction is really the reason why uh, music has such power. In other words, it's bringing together the most highly evolved parts of our brains that do pattern recognition, analysis of sounds that are coming in, predicting what's going to happen next with the most sort of strongly uh, emotional parts of the brain that have to do with um, the experience of pleasure. And that is probably why music and perhaps uh, other uh, aesthetic uh, experiences are so powerful and why they're so universal in our species. And so I want to leave you with that idea and uh, just be sure I thank all of the many people who have contributed to this work, uh, all of my colleagues, some of whom are here this evening, um, all of the students, none of whom are here because they're busy working in the lab. <laughs> and uh, again, a special thanks to CIFAR and the Israeli Foundation for uh, putting on this whole show and to the uh, funding agencies that have been uh, generous with their support. Thank you so much. <laughs>